Tonight on Rick Dancer TV, we're going to do a couple of cool things. We're going to introduce you to this family that I absolutely love, who are in the process of uh, building a home with Habitat for Humanity. Um, when we met these people, we just said, this is the folks we've got to focus on. So we're going to begin a three-part series on them tonight. Also, I'm going to introduce you to a guy named Jeff Sherwood. Um, he's a guy who uh, I met at the gym and uh, saw some promise in him, made a couple of connections for him and uh, found him a place to express his talent. And also we're going to take you to Eugene's new queer bar to introduce you to what the concept is there, what people are doing. And we're going to have a little bit about Grow Your Mo and Prostate Cancer coming up on Rick Dancer TV. I'm not dead. That sounds like something interesting. <laughs> I'm Rick Dancer. For the next three weeks, we're going to be introducing you to a family, the Martinez family. <clears throat> I love these people. They're uh, one of the newest clients uh, in the process of getting a home with Habitat for Humanity. And when we met these people, we said, oh my word, <laughs> we can't let them get away because they are one of the nicest families. And what's really cool about this project is they're doing it with uh, the communities of faith. So we've got uh, Jewish and Christian people working side by side to build these people a house. So tonight we're going to show you part one and then over the next few weeks we'll show you the other parts of their story. So meet the Martinez family. We've definitely uh, been ready to get out of this house for a long time now. Andres and Brenda Martinez understand what it means to be trapped. Right now it's we're sharing the house with my mom. Sharing helps save on rent but with two small children, five years is a long time to share. But that's not the only problem with living here. That's, we were only able to put their beds over here because one, they have mold problems inside. It's not insulated well, and there's a lot of old windows in the back of the house and old doors on it, so there's leaks everywhere. We have to pay over $200 a month for electricity. But the biggest problem is the feral cats in the neighborhood that make the yard unsafe for the children. It's disgusting and that's so unsanitary for kids to touch that. That's what they do, just wandering on the sidewalks. And we have a little wood patio in the back and that's the only part of the backyard they can use is that wood patio. Andres and Brenda were so close to getting a down payment on their first home when Andres discovered he had cancer. The medical bills took all of our savings and my medical problems. Not only did we have to spend all my money, but now I can't make as much because I can't work as much. To better his chances of survival, Andres had a difficult surgery done that left him with a lot of side effects. For a time, it seemed their dream for their first home would never come true. After we got into Habitat and the down payment savings plan thing that we started the IDA account, that's when we realized, okay, now we can finally put the rest of our money towards the medical bills get that wiped out and start with a clean slate and it, it all worked out perfect thanks to Habitat. Turned everything around, it made it so we could pay everything off that we needed to. We're in better situation now than we were before these medical bills hit us thanks to Habitat. It completely switched everything around. There's so many situations where weight's been taken off my shoulder, especially when you're cured of cancer. And you know you're gonna live longer, but this is like probably the biggest weight I've ever had taken off my shoulder because this sets up my wife, my kids, my family. Whether cancer comes back or something comes to take me away, I know they're safe. This next guy we're going to introduce you to is a story of uh, oh, what people don't see in other people because of maybe a different ability that they have. Um, he met somebody who connected him to somebody else and now he's on the air at a radio station in Cottage Grove and living the dream. 
So this kind of shows you what you can do when you network people and you look beyond uh, their physical ability. It happens to, you know, privacy. In a small studio at KNND in Cottage Grove, Worry about someone looking over your shoulder. Different is proving to be a force, not a disability. I'm Jeff Sherwood. I'm 31 years old. Jeff needed a break. Radio talk show host Jacob Daniels took a chance. Is, is that when I first interviewed uh, Jeff and you know said, "Hey, do you want to come participate?" And I thought, "Well, you know, Jeff, you can do this particular role." I never in a million years thought that he would be actually talking on the radio and at times filling in for me when I'm not here. And he brought me on board and from there it's been phenomenal. It's kind of given me a sense of purpose. Purpose is vital to each of us. I think I think that's the case sometimes people that don't really know me. Um, they might they might see the way I walk or sometimes the way I express myself I might not always be as articulate as I could be and so and because of my learning disability, uh, I, I feel that, that sometimes I am a bit misunderstood. KNND station owner Cameron Wrighton is no stranger to the world of disabilities. Cameron is blind. All three of us on this show, we have different obstacles that we have to overcome personally. If I was worried about being misunderstood, I never would have taken the plunge. A break is hard to find. This is a guy that has a journalism degree from the University of Oregon, and he's, you know, kicking and screaming trying to find work and I recognized real quickly that it wasn't for a lack of credentials it's just because he's a little bit different. I was uh, two and a half months premature so um, I think um, I've definitely overcome a lot of obstacles and I've went on to do a lot of great things and I still have a lot to accomplish. He's becoming more and more of a contributor to our program, and to me, that's great, because once he is able to do something in sports, which is his true passion, he's gonna be able to learn the different aspects. It's just, it's helping him learn to, to be, you know, a, a good reporter one day. I guess it's the drive of, of wanting to survive and prove, and prove my doubters wrong and, and prove the people that do, that do support me that it was all well worth it. A lot is said inside this little radio station. Uh, yeah, this was great. I enjoyed it. Cameron. Oh, good. And Always a pleasure. But perhaps even more important is what is unspoken, what is lived, compassion. Oh. It was brand new when Cy opened the store in uh, 1978. 50 pounds of flour when we make the dough, it actually makes about 100 pounds of dough. We do this every day. I figure over 37 years, we've probably made 13,000 batches of dough or more. It's the foundation of the pizza. Kind of the idea is you're just tightening it, getting the air out, no cracks, no holes in it. So from that two pound ball that had about a six inch diameter, we're taking it out to about 20 inches. Fresh ingredients, we make our dough, we grate our own cheese, we make our sauce, and I like to think that we make our pizzas with love. All right, that's 21 inch here. Size matters. Did you hear the news? McDonald's now offers all day breakfast. People love our breakfast. Whenever they want it. They can get their sausage egg McMuffin, their egg McMuffin, their hotcakes, burritos. We took the news and some of those breakfast burritos and egg McMuffins to a recent tailgate party at a duck game. So guys, as you guys hear that McDonald's has breakfast all day now. Breakfast all day at McDonald's? I mean, I will give you some fresh McDonald's breakfast because now you can get it all day. I'm loving it. Breakfast <laughs> oh. all day at McDonald's. Want breakfast burrito? It's 1.10, breakfast all day. Go! Go get your breakfast! It's <laughs> really breakfast all day at McDonald's. Breakfast what? all day? Are, you've got to be kidding wait, me. Wait, wait, wait. I thought it was until 11. Hey, McDonald's! Thanks for the breakfast! Go Ducks! <laughs> what? Okay, what I want? All day, every time of day. <laughs> Yes, we have been waiting for all day breakfast, yeah. actually.
I'm Rick Dancer. This is What's Happening Downtown Eugene. And what's happening in downtown Eugene is we have our first queer bar in 10 years called The Wayward Lamb. And yes, I did say the word queer. <laughs> John, <laughs> this is John O'Malley. And he does work with marketing and events there for The Wayward Lamb. And thanks for being here. Of course. Thank you. So we had a nice conversation beforehand because I wanted to get all the... Uh, we, all the words on the table. Everything so we know what we're talking <laughs> about here. But what, I guess the, the first question for you, John, is why does Eugene need a queer bar? Um, I think why does it need is probably not the best question. It's something that we want. Uh, I've worked uh, the past year with the queer community, uh, and I noticed that uh, there was a lack of activity, um, but a pretty sizable community here. When you factor in the local community, and then you also factor in all the students, all the grad students, all the teachers at UO, um, that Eugene and Lane County has quite a large population of LGBT identified individuals, um, but there was nothing. Uh, and so I eventually met Colin uh, Graham, who's the owner. Uh, we started to talk about uh, the need versus the want. Um, and you know, Eugene's a funny place where it appears to be liberal, but we don't necessarily believe that it's 100% liberal. Um, and there was a real desire, a real want from uh, us to create a space that was for the community. There hadn't been one in 10 years. The last one was Neighbors uh, in 2006. Uh, and so we started to have this conversation with a lot of people and we noticed kind of the same thing. A lot of people wanted a space, wanted a space. Um, so I don't necessarily think need is it's really the right a, It's word. a business model and yeah. you're looking at people and saying, we have a gay community and a queer community out here. Yeah and they have no place to go and feel comfortable. And I think that's the thing people might not understand is, yeah. you know, as heterosexuals, we can go anywhere and feel comfortable because yeah. most everything out there is more targeted for that group of folks. Yeah. And so, uh, but you don't, this, this is not like your typical, can I say typical gay bar? This yeah, is- you can, I think you can, I think it's, uh, we're not very precious about it all, so. Thank uh, you, because it's so nice <laughs> to just be able to talk. You know what I mean? Sometimes it gets, you feel like you're, you're on eggshells. Yeah, there's, a, there's a, a lot of policing, and there's a lot of what can you say, and what you can't, can't say. And part of what you're doing with this is really educating all of us to the, the need, uh, the desire, and also the ability that, as heterosexuals, I can go to your, your bar and feel perfectly comfortable and, yeah. and maybe learn some things. Yeah, because for the most part, I go to your bars and you make me feel great. Um, it's just on the occasion where I don't feel safe uh, or my partner doesn't feel safe or someone in the trans community doesn't feel safe. These are all these little moments that happen over time um, that build up and cause uh, a stir with a community. Um, so a space that honors and dedicates itself to that community, people can go and feel safe. And I've always said this, but it's about leveling the playing field. It's right. not about segregating or exclusion or anything. It's just about leveling the playing field and having at least one space uh, that feels safe because Lord knows we have a million breweries, right. a million sports bars. Um, so it's funny to me when people say, is there a need for a space? And I'm like, well, is there a need for 17 sports bars? Right. Is there a need for 15 breweries? You know, uh, I think, you know, at the end of the day, it's a business. It's not a community center. Uh, it's a de facto community center because there isn't one. Uh, but is there a need? Maybe not, but there's certainly a desire and a want to have one. Right. And, and when uh, Colin was talking earlier, he said, if, if, the, what you guys plan for the inside of this is if Sean Connery were going to make a gay bar, what would it look like? <laughs> <laughs> I love that. That's really yeah, we wanted, I mean, uh, one of the things that Colin was awesome about was really kind of going against the grain of what people expect a queer space to look like. Um, you know, Because Eugene probably wouldn't go to that. No, well, I think Eugene did go to that. They used to have these bars, but uh, we like this idea of playing against that because that model has existed and it's actually not successful for the most part unless you live in a huge city that can support it, like New York or Chicago or LA. But for a town like Eugene, where it is relatively small in comparison, uh, we, we really had to focus on what that space was and how could that space appeal to the largest demographic at least within the queer community. And something that we noticed was, well, a lot of times when they build these bars, they build them for like a 21 to 35 age bracket, because that's when people are going out and they're drinking and they're having fun. But we noticed that there's a really broad, diverse community here, and it's not just gay men, it's everything. It's lesbians, transgendered, the full spectrum. And 
you know, a lot of them are like people that retire here, people that are uh, in the later part of their careers and they're settled because Eugene's a beautiful place. Um, and they just want a space where they can go out and have a drink and feel great because they know it's a dedicated space. Um, and, you know, that's also a great business model just right. uh, for a support of a bar is not just gearing it entirely for a 21 year old because that 21 year old is going to graduate from UO and leave. Right. Um, and, you know, so Unless that's they something find that's out unique how about hip Eugene. downtown Eugene is becoming and then they're going to want to stay. Oh, yeah. I mean, and I think certainly if you look into the tech sector and Colin, uh, spent uh, many years at Skype um, and has a very great knowledge of the tech community and knows how much it's changing here um, and how, what the influx is. And also with that means more uh, queer tech people because um, it's also another community that people uh, work in. Um, if you think about how tech can be remote, how people can work from their homes, a lot of people that are in the trans community might not necessarily be able to work in an environment um, that's like a public corporate office um, because they face discrimination or uh, getting outed at work. And so being able to work from home and work on your computer, that's actually a desirable career for, your, for many members in the community. So give us your location. we got to wrap up yeah. your location, where you are, hours, that kind of thing. Yep, we're located at 150 West Broadway between Charlton and Olive. Uh, we got big, beautiful open windows, so you can't miss us. Uh, and uh, we're open Monday through Sunday. Uh, Monday through Saturday, we're open from 11.30 to 2.30 a.m. and yep. Sunday. Food. Uh, yeah, we got great food. Uh, we have a menu that we've helped uh, design and create uh, that we serve lunch, uh, dinner, late night snacks. Um, we have a great bar menu that actually honors uh, the queer history of Eugene through specialty cocktails, um, which is really fun. So if you want to learn a little history lesson, you can come have a cocktail. Well, thanks for broadening uh, our horizons yeah. and also the business in downtown Eugene. And uh, thanks for our conversation. It's yeah. been nice to know that I can have this conversation. <laughs> you, of course. <laughs> yeah. It's good to see you, John. Thanks for thanks being here. Thanks for having us. us. Yeah, you're welcome. The South Lane School District, which is Cottage Grove, <clears throat> came up with this innovative idea. They created their own dental clinic. So they went to the school nurses and said, what's one of the biggest obstacles to educating our kids? And the answer was dental work, dental problems. Kids had so many dental problems that they couldn't concentrate because their mouth, their teeth hurt. Um, some of the dentists who volunteer at this clinic say they've been to Haiti and seen better teeth in Haiti than we have right here in our community. So anyway, the purpose of telling you about this is to really need some volunteer hygienists and dentists. So if you know someone who is a hygienist or a dentist, or you yourself are, and you have a little bit of time to give, contact the, the, the clinic down in Cottage Grove. We'll put the number up here for you. And, uh, and let them know that you're interested, because I'll tell you what, you know, there's uh, a lot of things we can do to affect people, but when you hit the rubber with the road, th this is a basic need that's really getting in the way of some kids getting educated, so they could really use your help. It's a great way to build relationships. If you're looking for a barber who understands the art of cutting hair, Francesco Michelli is the man. This guy really knows what he's doing. He takes his time, he understands his customer, and he knows what makes you look good. They even do the little extras, like a straight razor shave to get those little hairs off of all those places. Yep, even the top of ears. I'm telling you, if you want a good haircut, somebody who knows what they're doing, a true artist, go to my barber, Fresh Cut, at Analog, Francesco Michelli, he's the man. 541-357-6903. You'll love it. A couple of years ago, the Willamette Valley Cancer Institute came to me and said, Rick, we'd really like you to do some spokesman work for us on prostate cancer. And the reason they were coming to me is because they had just purchased the Calypso system, which is a radiation system. Just happens to be the system I used when I went to OHSU because it wasn't here. Now Calypso is here in Eugene, and that's why you see my picture in the paper or in Eugene Magazine or whatever. Um, kind of letting guys know that this treatment is available. Um, we're going to introduce you to a man who also used the treatment, but um, and then when we come out of this story, we're also going to tell you about Movember, which is 
all this stuff growing on my face. There's a contest going, and you need to get online and vote for me. It only costs a buck, but we want to make sure that I get the Hairy Beard Face Award from the um, Oregon Cancer Foundation. So I'll show you more about that in just a minute. Okay, so ground shipping will be there Tuesday. And you don't need any extra insurance. Right. At the office, I work 12 hours a day, sometimes six days a week, but I'm never tired. Just don't have tired in me. 68-year-old Jim Westcott is an active, busy man. Though I don't think of myself as old as my birthday, say I am, but I do like to work out and stay strong. Jim stays in shape. He's precise and detailed, especially when it comes to his health and his cars. I always have amazing looking cars and inside and out, keep them really sharp. When Jim's doctor diagnosed him with prostate cancer, Jim did what comes naturally. He researched many treatments. I actually did not feel threatened. I did not feel it was going to end my life. So before I had gotten this diagnosis, I knew that cancer of the prostate was fairly well lo localized if you caught it fairly early. Jim did his homework and picked a newer radiation treatment, Calypso, over surgery. The surgery was the most devastating uh, and one of, the, one of the more common alternatives to radiation. And the surgery has a great uh, impact on your lifestyle. It takes you out, takes you out of commission. I can't go to work anymore for, for a period of time. Uh, there's um, just a real drag on my lifestyle with the um, urinary problems, uh, you could have um, sexual difficulties. I didn't want to go through that if I could avoid it. Willamette Valley Cancer Institute in Eugene was the only treatment facility that offered Calypso right here in Jim's hometown. And I met Dr. Fryfield at Willamette Valley Cancer Institute and came away feeling this is what we want to do. The Calypso is going to be our best treatment, safest treatment. It's uh, close to home. It's a very, very precise way to treat prostate cancer, and um, it fit what I needed. Calypso, called GPS for the body, precisely targets radiation treatments after three miniature radio beacons the size of rice grains are inserted into the prostate. And it was put on a gown, lay on the table, so I just laid there, and then they fired this device up and it went around me twice. The machines whirred and made funny noises, which I got really used to after a few days. And we did that every day, and by, you know, 30 minutes after the treatment, I was back at work. As far as follow-up, that's the only thing I have scheduled. Do every six months or so, do a PSA, and um, just make sure it's still knocked down and not going to come back. I would definitely do this again in a second. The Calypso was so precise, um, such a painless way to go. My lifestyle was impacted 20 minutes a day for, for 25 days. Um, that's it. Other than that, there was no impact on my lifestyle. So I, I find that pretty good compared to weeks and weeks of recovery, maybe a week in the hospital. It's glass, right? and then weeks and weeks of uh, catheters and uh, urinary problems, uh, a lot of therapy on that. We'll see you soon, be there Tuesday for you. Now this was by far the best treatment I could find. We have this little contest going for the Oregon Cancer Foundation called Grow Your Mo. Just go to growyourmo.org and you'll see all these faces of different people, but don't pay attention to any of them. You need to go down to Rick Dancer and it costs a buck, but the money goes to help uh, families who are going through cancer treatment pay some of their extra bills. That's what the Oregon, Foundation, Oregon Cancer Foundation does. So you can go on there, just click on my name. Uh, donate a dollar or donate 10 because we're having a contest to see who can win at the end of the month and I want to be the hairy guy. I want to be the one who wins, who has the best mustache. I don't do just a mustache. I have to do the full beard because uh, 1970s porn star like uh, doesn't work. So anyway, go on there, find out more about it and uh, get involved. It's a fun month and it's still early. You can still start growing your own if you want to. Ladies, I don't recommend it. Girls with beards. Mm. 
So I leave you tonight with a little story. I'm sitting in my office here, and uh, a couple of months ago, a, a gentleman who uh, is basically homeless, and um, he, he is a self-described alcoholic and looking for some assistance, came by my office, and, and uh, Aaron just walked in, and we started having a chat. And so now periodically he'll just stop by and come in and, and say hi to me. And today he walked in my office and uh, I'll tell you, it's so humbling uh, when you see how, what people go through and how hard they work at just living. I was sitting here asking him, I always ask hard questions, any of you that know me, I, I love to ask people questions. And I said, what do you believe about life? And Aaron looked at me and, and kind of get a little teary and he says, it's really hard. Life's really hard. And he says, it's just hard for me to do basic things like clean and clean up and take a shower. And um, so he's going to go to uh, the Willamette family uh, and, and, and look at getting into their program to get some treatment. And so he and I were just having a, a chat and he loves coming in here because <laughs> he thinks I'm famous. And, uh, and I just told him, you know, Aaron, you and I aren't that different. And he looked at me kind of puzzled and said, yeah, we are. And I said, no, we're really not. You have your problems and you deal with them the way you're learning to deal with them and trying to cope. And I have my problems and I just have healthier ways maybe to, to deal with my issues. And then I said, you know, here's kind of what I'm doing now. I, I believe that I have the capability to do bad things and the capability to do good things in my life. And what am I going to feed? So it's whatever I feed is what's going to rule me. And so my new kind of method of operation is I'm not feeding the beast. I'm not going to feed the bad. I can't concentrate on feeding the good. I have to, I'm a, I'm a guy. I can't multitask. I do one thing at a time. All I do is focus and say to myself, don't feed the beast. Aaron looked at me and had this big smile on his face and he goes, I get it. And then I said, Aaron, See what I mean? You and I are not that different. And you know what's funny? He goes, Rick, I love coming in here. And you know, maybe we all just need to take a little more time and let the errands of the world just come into our office, uh, sit in a chair, and then really be interested in their lives and ask them some questions. It was actually probably blessed me at least as much as it did him. And I think it might have blessed me a little bit more. So have a good week. Go out. I hope you think about that. Um, stuff's going through your head. Don't feed the beast. And when somebody steps into your life, take time. Thanks for joining us. One last thing I want to remind you about is Rick Dancer Media Services. We do a lot of things, everything from social media to videos for YouTube, videos for our show, videos for your website. We can produce a show from your location. Give us a call. We're really reasonable and we want to get the message out and help you. And so give me a call. My phone number is right there on the screen or go to my website, rickdancer.com or rickdancer.tv and let me know what we can do for you and let's chat.